If you are a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you want more money to fund your deals, regardless of your credit, regardless of your income, regardless of your experience in real estate investing, uh, you are at the right place. All right. I'm getting ready to plug you into the money here in just a second. I'm Jay Connor uh, and welcome to the show. Uh, I'm known as the Private Money Authority. And of course, the show that you're here viewing or listening to is Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. What we talk about here is uh, all things uh, related to real estate investing. Um, the majority of our discussions are about single family houses. And uh, if you are a first time viewer or a listener, then uh, you are going to be so pleased to learn what this show is all about. I have some of the biggest names and most popular um, real estate investing specialists and uh, success stories here on the, uh, on the show uh, that cover all different topics of real estate investing from um, wholesaling to uh, rehabbing to uh, all different ways of finding deals, all different ways of uh, different exit strategies. Uh, and in fact, on this show, uh, I've got as my guest, Joe McCall, who's from St. Louis and uh, I'm my lands. I thought I was the king of automation and I think I'm going to have to relinquish that title over to Joe. Uh, I'm going to introduce him in just a moment, but uh, he's in the green room waiting to come on right now. But um, uh, Joe, I mean, he travels with his, with his family for two and three months and his entire real estate investing business runs on automatic. So you're going to love Joe when I introduce him here in just a moment. But as I said a moment ago, I'm going to plug you into the money. So right around the corner, it's not far away, right around the corner, upcoming live event. You definitely want to check out and get registered and attend. Um, and I'll go ahead and uh, put the website uh, right here on the screen. You can go check it out and uh, you get to come for free since you are a follower. I mean, there's a, a simple $97 registration, but you can go right here to www.jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash all in lowercase money podcast. Jay Connor with an E-R, jayconner.com forward slash all in lowercase money podcast. And if you're listening on uh, iTunes, uh, be sure and subscribe so you don't miss out on future shows. And uh, I'd really appreciate you rating the show and uh, giving me a review. And if you're watching on YouTube, then uh, you can put in the comment section right below, subscribe of course, to the show. And you, in the comment section uh, below, you can uh, put your real estate investing questions and uh, we'll get all of your questions answered. And folks, as I mentioned a few moments ago, I'm so excited to have as my special guest here on the show today, Mr. Joe McCall. And Joe is a dear friend of mine. We met, uh, it's coming up on just about a year ago. We're uh, in a mastermind together with some other fantastic go-giver type of individuals. And that's one of the reasons that I'm having Joe here on the show today is because Joe lives and breathes what uh, being a servant and having a servant's heart is all about. Um, I first heard of the book about a year ago called The Go-Giver. And by the way, if you don't have the book, Go-Giver, be sure and get it. And Joe lives out uh, the principles of that book. Um, I mean, fantastic. So just a little bit about Joe and we'll bring him on here. He's uh, from St. Louis, so he lives in the same city that uh, my sister lives in. He's been in the real estate investing space since 2009, and it's amazing the kind of deals he's done. He's done well over a hundred deals and he's helped other students do you know, countless thousands more. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you all something. You definitely want to stay on to the end of the show because Joe is going to be giving out absolutely free his lease option book, wholesaling lease options that he just held up there to the camera. And um, so stay on to the show and you'll learn how you can get that book absolutely free from Joe. Uh, my lands, you know, until I met Joe, I thought I was the king of automation, but <laughs> I think I'm going to have to uh, relinquish my title over to my friend Joe, because here's part of what Joe's lifestyle is all about and freedom. He does real estate deals, folks, uh, while traveling the world with his family. 
I mean, it's common for him to take two and three month vacations with his family and his deal flow and his real estate investing business continues to work in automatic. We're going to dive deep into that here on the show. And Joe's going to pull the curtain back and tell us exactly, uh, you know, what that looks like. So with that, my good friend, Joe McCall, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. How are you? I'm doing fantastic here in Eastern North Carolina. And from the looks of you there on the camera uh, with the microphone, it looks like you're not in Italy today. It looks like you're probably at home in St. Louis, right? I am in, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, go Cardinals, even though they're not in the playoffs, but still a huge Cardinals fan. I love St. Louis, Missouri. I travel a lot um, just for vacation and business. In fact, I'm going to be in North Carolina in Raleigh in uh the end of this week oh is that, the, uh, is that the tria event yes yeah i'll be there awesome. hey i'm so glad you're coming uh, my good friend chuck jurgens yeah um really was one of the co-founders of that group and and i've spoken up there a number of times you're gonna love that crowd uh, Joe. great event yeah. looking forward to that um but i love st louis you know we've traveled a lot i have a wife and four kids and um a couple times well three or four times we've been to Prague four times. One time we were there to Prague for six months. Um, and another time we were there with all of our kids for three months, twice, and um, was able to do deals while being in Prague and traveling around Europe had a blast. And then um, about three or four years ago, we took an RV trip for three months around the Northwestern corner of the U S. And so I love automation. I, you know, my big philosophy is, um, there's three keys to success in this business, marketing, automation, and delegation. And when you figure those three things out, if you can do deals in one market, there's no reason why you can't do deals in eight different markets. If you can do one deal a month, there's no reason why you can't do eight. It's just a matter of figuring out marketing systems and delegation, getting the right people on your team. And uh, it's, it's not that complicated. I love it. Well, we're going to dive deep into that here in a few minutes. Um, so let's let's put the uh, re let's put the recorder or or the timeline on rewind for a little bit, and tell our viewers and uh, listeners here what did the world uh, the Joe McCall world look like prior to the days of real estate investing? Good question. I was um, my degrees in civil engineering. I went to Iowa State University. I was actually raised in San Diego, but moved to Des Moines, Iowa, my junior year in high school. Does that mean you're a thinker brain by nature? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think overthink things quite a bit. So, but I, I moved to Iowa. It was quite the culture shock my junior year in high school um, and went to Iowa State University, got a degree in civil engineering. And um, I loved engineering. I liked math and science. And uh, so that's helped me in some ways, but it's also been a hindrance for me in some ways too in my real estate investing business, because I'm always have tend to overanalyze things and um, that can, that can be a hindrance, right? Yeah. Um, so it was about, I was working for an electrical engineering company. We were building power plants out in California. And so they, I was, I, I, my, they, I went to go work for a company in Kansas city, but then they started transferring me all over the country and we just bought a house. Six months later, they shipped us out to San Diego to work on a big job or um, San Francisco. And um, so we had to rent our house out. And so I kind of became an accidental landlord. It was a horrible experience. I said, I'm never going to own rental property ever again, but it was right about that time. I read the, the famous book, rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. And I just got the real estate bug. I had some other friends that were starting to invest in real estate. And so I thought, you know what? Um, this is pretty cool. I need to figure this real estate thing out. So that started my journey back in 2006, learning okay. about real estate, studying it, went through, bought a ton of courses, lots of boot camps and workshops and, and um, went full time into real estate in 2009. Okay. So now you said something that I want to drill down on for a moment. Uh, you're a thinker brain by nature. Uh, your nature is to overanalyze things. Yeah. And so I'm sure you've seen, uh, well, you've experienced it, but I'm sure you've seen other new real estate investors uh, wanting to get into the business that 
have the same uh, challenge of overanalyzing, but obviously you were able to break through that. What I've seen with so many new real estate investors that are the thinker brain mentality, the overanalyzing uh, actually stops them in their tracks uh, to where they never end up pulling the trigger. They don't take action. So from your experience, from your, you know, from your own experiences, what advice can you give to the folks that have that same challenge of overanalyzing? And what is it that, that you can tell them to help them to move towards taking action? It's a great question. Great question. And that's a hard question to answer too, because there's no easy answer. For me, I had to get over, I had to be okay with making mistakes. And I had to come to terms with that every deal is completely different. When you're looking at a math problem or a science problem, usually there's one problem and there's one solution, right? And there's one formula to get to that one solution. Plain, black and white, cut and dry. That's it. There's no multiple different answers. There's not different ways to get to the same answer. It's like, it's just facts. It's black and white. When you're designing a building or power plant, like I used to work on, there was blueprints and designs and drawings. And um, all if you wanted the answer to how to build this thing, you look at the drawings and it's there. Step one through 560. So when I was starting to dig into real estate, I, I figured... I thought I had to have all my questions answered. I thought I had to have everything figured out from step one to step eight um, before I would ever even take step one. Um, I had to have all my I's dotted, all my T's crossed. And I realized that's a great way to get broke um, because um, you, you're not going to make money by studying, right? Studying, and, and I'm, I'm a big believer in education, but studying will not make you money. Um, you need to start taking action. And so many of us and me at the beginning, I was always getting ready, right? I was getting ready to do my marketing, getting ready to talk to sellers, getting ready to make offers, getting ready to make that phone call, to place that ad, to go see the seller and meet the, go see the property, always getting ready. And I felt like I was accomplishing something by buying another course. So um, <laughs> I, I don't cuss, um, but there is this one video I saw by a guy and he said, there's two secrets to success um, in business. Number one, stop farting around. He used the other word, stop farting around. And number two, stop being a sissy. He used the other word. Okay. <laughs> you want to be successful in business, stop farting around and stop being a sissy. And what he means by stop farting around was, um, you know, like we get this crack cocaine high when we buy a new course and we're like, oh yes, right. This is a secret. This is, I'm, now I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen. And you buy the course and you crack it open and you're excited, but then doubt starts coming in and you start questioning things and like, well, what about this? What if this happens? What if that happens? And, um, you're just, you're just farting around, you know, like, um, Really, if, if you would like, if a terrorist were to put a gun at your head and said, go make an offer, you would go figure out how to make an offer on a house, right? You'd go to YouTube or podcasts like yours and you would do a search for, okay, how do I make an offer? Um, you wouldn't overanalyze 300 properties to get comps. You wouldn't go see the house. You wouldn't go get a contractor to give you estimates and look at 20 comps and, and uh, do all of this stuff. Like you would just go to Zillow you would, you would guess like 30,000 for repairs and you would subtract, um, you know, like you'd go to YouTube and you say how to make an offer on a house. Right. And you would see the Mayo formula, the ARV. Okay. Just use Zillow for ARV times 70%. Good. Minus repairs. You just 30,000 for repairs minus your wholesale fee, 10,000 for wholesale fee. Bam. There you go. You'd have an offer, right? Well, now you need a contract. So what would you do? You got a gun at your head. Well, you'd say, okay, uh, I'd go to YouTube. And or go uh, like you go to Google and do a search for contract, like a wholesaler's contract, or you go to Office Depot or Office Max or Staples, whatever it is. And you know how they have those generic contracts there at, at the store? Yeah. You go buy a generic purchase and uh, purchase real estate contract for fuck five bucks, and you would go and put your offer on that and you'd send it, right? And you'd get the offer made and the, and the terrorists would say, okay, and would leave you alone, would go away. Right. Right. You would get it done. So, so we're, we're, we need to stop farting around. 
And the other thing is, well, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, stop being a sissy. Part of it is we're so afraid to make mistakes, right? Um, like we'll go out and spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on courses and products, right? But we freak out about spending a few hundred dollars on some direct mail or some marketing or hiring a virtual assistant, you know, like stop, stop being so scared and get out there and just make it happen. Um, some, some, some of the best advice I'd ever seen. So, yes. uh, go ahead. so my question, my question is, what was the gun at your head that caused you to finally take action and do a flipping deal? That's great because my back was against a wall. I spent thousands of dollars in education. I hadn't made any money. I spent one time $13,000 on coaching program on three different credit cards. And uh, my wife was like supporting me was like, yeah, okay, let's do it. If you say it's going to work, then let's do it. And I said, I, I can get the money back in like two deals. This is, e but you know, nothing happened with that. And it, I, I started to blame the coaching program and um, blame the educational material. Cause I thought it was too elementary, too basic. I was complaining like, oh man, we spent 13 grand on this stuff and I can get it all for free on the internet. I'm like, I was so stupid. I was complaining about this stuff. Well, looking back at that course, I mean, just a, a few months ago, I was looking at that course and looking at it thinking, yeah, this is really basic, simple stuff. But if I would have just done it, if I would have done just 25% of what they told me to do, I could have made my money back a lot sooner. So my back was against the wall. I'd spent tons of money on education. Hadn't made any. We were losing our house to a short sale. I had, I had some, we were like in serious cash crunch. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but I thought I got to learn how to do wholesaling. This is what I started doing, wholesaling. I got to learn how to make quick cash. So I decided I'm going to buy one more course. And uh, I did. I bought one more course because I, I didn't have I, just one more. But I said, this is what was different. I said, I'm going to do what this guy says to do. And I'm not going to question anything. I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to stop asking what if. And I'm going to start asking what next, what's the next thing I got to do. Okay. I got to, I didn't like his postcards, but I sent it anyway. I didn't like his, the, how he made offers, but I did it his way. Anyway, I didn't like how he said to talk to sellers and how he said to find buyers, but I'm going to do it anyway, doggone it. And I did, I didn't change anything. I did it the way he said to do step by step. And within a few months I did my first deal. I made like $13,000. Um, I was so nervous, man. I thought I had all the education in the world, but like I was still nervous. So, but when I finally did that first deal, it was such a huge relief. And I was so excited because now I was like, this is real. I can actually make money in this business. It's not just some pipe dream. It's not some guru putting a fake testimonial on a presentation, which I saw all those webinars and sales pitches. And I thought they were fake. Um, so anyways, just mentally getting out of my own way and being willing to make mistakes and just taking massive action. It wasn't until then that I started actually doing deals. That's awesome, Joe. In fact, I had that same conversation with one of my students this very morning on a conference call. They got the knowledge. I mean, this person is one of the smartest people that I've ever coached in real estate investing. And those were the exact words I said. I said, man, the only, the only challenge you got is you, you know, it's you, you got to get out of the way and, and take the action. So man, I can, I, I have got to call up my student and get him to listen to this show that you are on Joe, because my land, y'all are like, you know, he's, he's going to relate to what you just said so much. You said something just a moment ago, Joe, that I absolutely love. And we, I've got to have this in the show notes because it's powerful. And I've never heard anybody else put these two phrases together like you just did, but it's perfect. And that is stop thinking and saying what if, and start thinking and saying what's next. Yes. That is, Isn't that good? Powerful. That is powerful, <laughs> man. Um, okay. So. Cause you, you'll get stuck in an infinite loop. Of like what if this happens or what if the attorney, my attorney says I can't do the wholesaling. And what if, um, the seller rejects my offer. What if I get it under contract and I can't find a buyer? Well, you know what? What if pigs fly out of your ass? Like, 
<laughs> Isn't that funny? You like that one too? You should you should write that down. <laughs> ah! oh, mercy. So that made my face turn red. <laughs> you could ask those kinds of questions like forever. But this is how you can get success in business. Take the first step. You get oh, Jenny's course Lord. on private money. You say, all right, Jay says to go send this letter or go to these meetings. All right, I'm going to do that. Boom, you go do that. You go back and you say, all right, Jay, what do I do next? Okay, do this. Go ask him this question. Okay, I'm going to ask him that question. Okay, then you're talking to the potential investor. Okay, hold on a second. Jay, what do I do next? Okay, Jay says do this. I'm going to do this next. And if you take that attitude of just like, hey, what do I do next? Stop worrying about step seven and eight. Just start doing steps one and two, and you'll figure the steps out as you go. That's just the way it works. I love it, man. I love it. So, um, so besides taking too long to take action, besides that, what's one of your biggest mistakes you've made in real estate investing and what did you learn from it? Well, you know, like we were just saying, my biggest mistake was not starting earlier and, right. and, and being so scared um, and being a sissy um, and farting around. Those are my right. biggest, but you know, the deal, biggest deal mistake that I've done. Uh, I, every rehab that I've done, I've lost money on. So I hate rehabbing. Right. <laughs> I, I'm not a rehabber. Hey, look, I'm going to come to your seminar on wholesaling and you're going to come to my seminar on rehabbing. <laughs> So, hey, hey, check this out, Joe. I have never wholesaled a deal in my life. Can you, you believe? Have you ever lost money on a rehab? Of course. Okay. Well, but so, you've never lost money on a wholesale deal, right? Uh, well, that's why I love wholesaling because if I'm going to lose money on it, I can get out of the deal, right? Yeah. I, I just don't buy it. Um, I've, I've only made like $250 on a wholesale before. Right. I lose money as far as there I can go. remember. But, uh, you know, yeah. I've. <laughs> Thank goodness the ones that I've lost money. So I'm, I'm right around, right now I'm right around 400 rehabs I've done. Thank goodness I can count on one hand the losses. Yeah. <laughs> and your, your gains far outweigh the losses. But you know what, Jay? That's the best way to learn, right? Like you yep. learn, it's, it, you, you maybe you lost 50 grand on a rehab, but that was a 50 grand seminar that you, you learned what not to do. So that's my <laughs> point. In this business, you're going to learn best by failing and making mistakes. So you need to invite mistakes. You need to invite failure. That's a good thing. And uh, the faster you get to those mistakes, the faster you'll get into the deals. Here's the other thing I want to say. You got you to lean in. You know, when you get discouraged and you're like, oh, man, this is overwhelming. Like, I'm. what if this happens? What? what? You got to lean in. Like, if you look at all of success you've had in your business, Jay, and, and me, like, how many times could we have quit? Could we have said, you know oh. what, this is too hard. I, you know, even in, in, in marriage and in parenting and in life or school or in your regular jobs and especially, you know, even real estate investing, if we would have quit, man, we wouldn't be anywhere where we are today. Right. But when, there, when we come into those hard times, you got to lean into it and say, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to figure it out. And, um, that that's where the success is from. Yeah. I, um, uh, one, uh, one of my mantras that I find myself telling other people right regular is I got great news. And that is, it is impossible. It's impossible for you to fail until you decide to quit. You mm, know, we got the choice, you know? So, uh, okay. That's all. So your, your, your specialty is wholesaling. All right. So let's be perfectly clear for all of our listeners and viewers, different people have different definitions I've learned of wholesaling. I thought there was like the engineer, right? And I'm not an engineer. I'm like 180 degrees from an engineer, right? But, but, but I, thought, I thought it was like one and one is two. Okay, boom and boom and boom, that's a wholesale deal. Not the case. So let's come here into, into your head, Joe. In your world, what is your definition of wholesaling and what does a wholesale deal look like? Yeah. So it's flipping paper is what it is. Flipping paper. Yeah. I don't have a piece of paper in front of me, but like <laughs> you get, you get a contract with the seller to buy their house at a steep discount. That's my A to B. 
Then I advertise that contract to another investor who's going to take my place. So let's just use numbers. And All I'm going right. to sell that contract for a fee of five, 10,000 bucks. So let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar house. Yep. And um, it doesn't need any work. It's perfect shape. I'm going to get it under contract to buy it for $75,000 from the seller. 75 grand. I'm going to have 30 days to close. I have a two week inspection contingency in there to inspect it and all that. So I get it under contract to buy it for $75,000. I'm going to turn around and advertise that contract for a $5,000 assignment fee to another investor to, it could be a rehabber or a landlord, another investor. So there's two ways that I can make money. Then I can double close on the deal or I can assign my contract. All right. Let's define, let's define both of those. What's a double closing and what's an assignment. So double close is when I say, all right, to this investor, I'm going to sell you this house or this contract for $80,000. He says, great. Um, and again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds in this, but basically what happens is he gives me $80,000. As soon as I get his money, I give the seller $75,000 and I keep the difference. Okay. Now the title company will help you with all of that. The easier way to do it is with an assignment. And so I just say, all right, I have this contract. I'll assign it to you for $5,000. The guy says, great. So my, again, the title company or the attorney will just write an assignment agreement and I'll assign the contract. And then this investor takes my place and he has to close or she has to close on the date that I was supposed to close with the seller. Now I have, I have 30 days to close, but I also have a two week inspection contingency. If I can't find a buyer to assign my contract to or sell my contract to them, then I, I might need to back out of the deal. Um, and so I, that's why I use that con inspection contingency period of a couple of weeks to make sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's it. That, that's a simple version of it. You know, I also wholesale lease options. So I may have a, um, a house under contract to lease option with the seller. Well, I can then assign that contract to a tenant buyer, somebody who's going to live in the house. So I can, like it's the same, just like reg regular wholesaling, instead of selling my contract to an investor, I'm selling my contract to a tenant. Okay, that's cool. So you got really, you got, you, you've got the same perhaps world of sellers, but you got two different exit strategies of who you're going to sell to, either a tenant buyer or an actual real estate investor that's going to, you know, uh, close out on the deal that you yep. have negotiated, right? Yes. Yeah. So the the free book you're going to give away here at the end of the show is your free book going to go into some more of that detail because i know we got some viewers and listeners that are scratching their head going i really want to know more about that yeah so i have a book um, on lease options it's called wholesaling lease options and it's what i used to quit my job in 2009 so i was okay. doing a lot of wholesaling um this is you know the market was free falling in 2009 oh and, yeah um there were still people doing wholesaling traditional wholesaling but um, I found like I was spending a lot of money on marketing for the few sellers that had a lot of equity and a lot of motivation and all the other investors were targeting that same seller. So I thought, well, you know what? There's a lot more. I'm throwing away a lot of leads that don't have any equity in them. What if I did a lease option on some of these leads that didn't have any equity? And instead of selling my contract to an investor, I'll sell it to a tenant. And that's what I started doing. And um, within about three months in the spring of 2009, I was making more money flipping lease options, doing lease option assignments than I was in my full-time job. And I was making about 80 grand a year, 75, 80 grand a year in my engineering job. So that's when uh, I finally jumped ship and started doing that. So that's what I wrote this book about wholesaling lease options, um, about how I did, how I do those deals. And it's a real simple book. You can read it in a couple hours. It's not yeah, very awesome. So on, so on the, on the deals where you are getting a lease option, uh, you're getting a contract um, and you're going to, and you're going to assign that to a tenant buyer themselves, not a real estate investor. It sounds to me like on a, some of those deals or a lot of those deals, you could be almost like uh, getting it under contract for like almost full retail price, right? 
You yeah. don't have to be buying it at a huge discount because your tenant buyer that you're going to assign it to doesn't need to buy it at a discount like a real estate investor does. Is that right? Yeah. So an example would be, let's say the house is worth $150,000 a day. The seller owes $140,000. There's really only kind of 10 grand in equity. Well, most investors would pass on that deal. There's not enough equity in it, right? That's right. But the seller, you know, they just got a job transfer to another market and they can't make another mortgage payment. They can't make two payments. They've tried selling it and they can't sell. So they'll be open. They, they, they're, they're resigning to the fact that they're going to have to rent it out, but they don't want to rent it to a tenant who's just going to call them every time the faucet leaks, right? They would rather rent it to a tenant buyer, somebody who's going to rent it with the option to buy it in the future. So I approach them and I say, hey, listen, do you want to do a lease option? What if me or one of my buyers could make your mortgage payment every month take care of the day-to-day day -to -day maintenance and repairs, and then buy the property um, for what you owe or maybe a little more, and you don't have to pay any real estate commissions. What would you want to do then? I said, that sounds great, right? Um, so I say, all right, I'll give you a contract. So I'll give them a contract to lease option it for, uh, let's so they owe 140, let's say. I'll give them a lease option contract to buy it for 140 in two years. And the rent, let's say the market rents in the area are $1,200 a month and their mortgage payments are $1,100 a month. I'll just give them a contract for uh, $1,100 a month or maybe even $1,200 a month. Okay, so there's no cash flow for me to stay in the deal in the middle. And uh, so then I say, all right, here's a lease option contract. And um, the way I kind of word mine is um, w w the... the um, it's a non-exclusive option. I don't want to complicate this any, but it's a non-exclusive, which means if the seller leases it or sells it on their own before I do, that's fine. They can cancel my agreement. I'm not, I don't want to tie up the property and take right. it off the market. Cause while I have, I'll have 60 days usually to find a tenant buyer to assign my contract to them for. Right. So then I advertise it. I bump the price up a little bit to maybe I have it under contract for 140 and 1200 a month. So mm -hmm. I'm going to advertise that lease option. Um, for a five thousand dollar assignment fee, so I might bump the price up to one forty five or one fifty, right? And so then, um, when I find a good tenant buyer that has a realistic chance of getting a mortgage in a year, and I work with a local mortgage broker who helps me with that, mm -hmm. then I will assign my contract to them, and then they just take my place, right? And then I'm completely out of the deal. Right. You got your assignment fee, and you're on to the next deal. Yeah. And that $5,000 assignment fee, if you do it the way I teach and you work with the right mortgage broker, that tenant buyer can get that money back applied towards their future down payment. But that 5,000 goes into hip pocket national bank and I can spend that. It doesn't have to sit in an escrow account. I can spend that money. That's my profit. That's my assignment fee. And then I move on. You just got to work with an escrow company that will let you, you know, that will work with you and a mortgage broker that, that will help you with that. Does that make sense? That's yeah, that makes sense. So, so now, you know, regardless of the, um, regardless of our exit strategy, whether we're going to wholesale, hotel, <laughs> rehab, retail, it doesn't matter our exit strategy. We still got to find the deals. Yeah, We got to find the motivated sellers. And so, you know, as you know, and I know there's tons of different ways to find deals, uh, whether they're in the MLS or they're off market for sale by owners. But in today's market, Joe, what are some of your top favorite ways to find motivated sellers that you can find those uh, discounted spreads? My two favorite ways, and I talk about that in this in the book, um, is number one, sending emails and text messages to landlords and for sale by owners on Craigslist and Zillow. Okay. All right, repeat that again. So emails and text, and text messages to for sale by owners and landlords and landlords. So uh, let me stop right there. Would you say in your business, maintaining a list of active landlords is really, really important? Yeah. Oh yeah. Because, um, you know, a lot of them are going to have deals. They may have a rental that they want to sell, but they, they don't want to discount it as deep as they need to. And they're tired of dealing with typical tenant headaches. So an idea of a lease option is real attractive to them because you know what? Now they get to rent their house to a tenant who wants to buy it, who's going to take better care of it typically. 
than a normal right. tenant would. Um, so I might be able to do lease option on their house. And uh, so landlords are a great resource to have. Um, so I have a virtual assistant that every day goes into Craigslist and Zillow and scrapes properties that have been posted for rent or for sale by owner. And we send them an email or we send them a text or both. And we just say, hey, we saw your property on Craigslist or Zillow. Looks like a mm -hmm. nice home. You wouldn't be interested in leasing it for a year and then selling it, would you? And that's how we get our foot in the door. If they respond back to the text or the email, yeah, I might be interested. Then my VA sends that lead to me and I get on the phone and I call the seller and talk to them or the landlord. My second favorite way. Uh, Let's stop there, Joe. Hang yeah, on, Joe. So I just heard you say something. So, I mean, you know, you yourself are actually calling the seller and doing the uh, conversation and getting the seller lead sheet and the negotiation. Well, when I started off, yes. Now I, I have other people that do that for me, but if you right. know, 99% of people listen that's to what you would do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So your other way that you like. Well, that's free, right? I mean, except for paying the virtual assistant, you could do that yourself. Um, right. The other way I like is networking with other investors who have dead leads, other wholesalers, other rehabbers, people that do a lot of marketing. You know, they're throwing away 75, 80% of their leads because there's not enough equity or the seller's not motivated enough or whatnot, right? right? So what if you networked with those other guys and gals and said, hey, listen, if you give me your dead leads or the leads that you'd normally throw away, and if I can do a lease option with them, then I'll split the deal with you 50-50. So what right. wholesaler would say no to that, right? And that that's a great way to get started because then you can say, you know, uh, you can split the deal with them. And then as you learn, as you start saving money, then you can start doing your own marketing um, or just pay the other wholesaler a thousand bucks instead of half the profit or something like that. So those are the two best free ways to find motivated sellers. Yeah. So when you say a net, networking with these other uh, wholesalers that have got these dead leads, um, what's your, what's your favorite or best ways you'd recommend to our viewers and listeners as to where do you find these other, you know, real estate investors and wholesalers? Yeah, well, they're everywhere. Uh, Google, you can Google, we buy houses, Houston and find out, by the way, people think you can't do lease options in Texas. You can, right. you, can't, you can't do lease option assign. I'm sorry. You can't do sandwich lease options, but you can do lease option assignments in Texas. Anyway, so you go to, you go to Google and you search for, we buy houses, Houston, see who's advertising in, in there. Go to Craigslist, see who's advertising houses as a wholesaler. Um, mm -hmm. You can go to Bigger Pockets. You can go to different Facebook groups. Uh, go to your local real estate clubs. Uh, one of my coaching business partners, Gavin, that's how he got started in Phoenix. He had no money. He went to the local real estate clubs. And you know when it, everybody took a turn saying, hey, what do you need or what do you have that you want to sell or whatnot? And he said, listen, um, I don't have uh, any deals, but I've got time. And if any of you've got old leads that you're sitting on, if I'll follow up on them for you. And if I get one of a deal, I'll split it, split it with you 50, 50. So we had two or three people come up to him and say, yeah, that's great. You know, I'm not doing anything with these old leads. You work them. And so he did, he got on the phone within a couple of weeks. He did like three deals. Wow. Split the deals with the, um, the other wholesalers. So people don't realize they're sitting on gold mines. You know, if you've been doing any marketing or you know any investors who've been doing a lot of marketing for a while, they're sitting on gold mines with old leads. And so right. sometimes all you need to do is just say, hey, maybe you can let me follow up with your dead quote unquote leads and right. maybe we can do a deal with them, right? So that's a great, if you're getting started, that's probably the best way to, to find good deals. Follow awesome. up with other people's dead leads. Yeah. Now, one thing that you said a moment ago was uh, working with landlords. All right. So if I wanted to quickly, you know, get a list in my target market area of landlords that I could like market my houses to or, you know, find them to see if they've got some deals they want to sell. What's the quickest way to put a active landlord list together in your target market? The cheapest, fastest, free, uh, cheapest, freest way. <laughs> be, uh, just go to Craigslist and Zillow and see who's advertising landlords properties right now. You can also go right. to go section eight.com. 
and find all the people who have uh, Section 8 housing. And so just start writing down the names and phone numbers. You're going to get a lot of property managers um, that are advertising. That's fine. Call the property managers up and say, hey, I'm an investor. I'm looking for deals. Do you have any clients that might have a house they want to sell? I'll let you represent me. You can get the commissions from it, you know? Um, so I had a student I was coaching one time. He was so hungry, um, <laughs> literally and figuratively. He would go to the donut shops, right? And get a dozen donuts and go to different property management companies, bring in the donuts and say, hey, I just want to introduce myself. I'm David. I'm looking for deals. Do you have any clients that might have a deal they want to sell? I've never met a property manager who's, who said, no, I don't have any clients that want to sell their properties. Um, so he started getting deals from property managers. And then he would also ask them, well, do any of your prop, do any of your clients, are they looking for more properties to buy? Right. And right. so he started selling his deals to these property managers and, and their clients. So anyway, it's about getting out there and just hitting the street, going to Craigslist, uh, going to the local real estate clubs, finding who the landlords are and, and keeping a database. And finally, you can buy a list at something like listsource.com. You can buy a list of all of the absentee owners in your area and your target market, and you can send them a letter. You can send them a postcard, um, things like that. One of my favorite things to do is find uh, a list of investors that bought in the last six to 12 months and right. send them a letter saying, hey, um, are you looking for more deals? One of, one of my favorite strategies is when I get a property under contract and I'm looking for an investor to buy it from me or to sell yeah. it to, um, I will send a handwritten desperate motivated seller, well, de desperate motivated buyer letter. Like, you know, we have motivated yellow letters for, for yeah. sellers, like, you know. Right. So I'll handwrite, uh, I don't do this, I get someone else, but handwrite a letter that says, urgent, I need help. I've got to sell this property today. I'm desperate. I've been trying to sell it for some time. I can't find anybody to buy it. Please, please, please help. The taxes are paid. The title is clear. I need this thing sold today. Please call me. And uh, then we crumple that letter up and then fold it, put it in an envelope, <laughs> hand address of the envelope with a real stamp. And we send that out. I'm not kidding, Jay. We'll get 20, 30% response rate on those letters, which is amazing. So I'll send that letter to all the investors who own rental properties in a one or two mile radius of my property. Right. And it works like crazy. It works really, really well. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. So we've talked about finding properties. We've talked about selling them. We've talked about uh, wholesaling. Uh, before we get to the end of the show, we got to talk about automating. So here's a 30,000 foot high question that you can go as deep as you want to on and take as much time as you want, because this is a really, really important question. Here's what the viewers and listeners want to know. How in the world do you go to Italy or Prague or the Caribbean or wherever it is you go with your family for two and three months? and have your business run on automatic. And a sub part of that question is, what do you do as in being involved with your business when you're going on those two and three month trips? Well, I asked myself a, a big question because I was, I had an acquisitions manager, I had a local team and it was great because we were doing a lot of deals at the time um, when I really started thinking about this. Um, we were doing four or five deals a week. It was really going well, but um, I was still working my tail off. I mean, I had an acquisitions manager. I had an assistant. Um, we had title companies. We had uh, these realtors, but it was like, I'm still like putting out a ton of fires. I asked, answering a ton of questions. I still had to go to the title company, still had to write checks. As I was making money, I still had to, you know, buy houses or you know, do earnest money checks. And I was frustrated with it. And I, I sat down and I wrote down a list of all of the things you have to do in a deal. And I just asked myself a real simple question. How can I do none of this? How can I get somebody else to do it all mm. for me? And mm. I said, all right, well, this part, my assistant can do that. Check. You know, if there's something that the VA has to do, well, I'll make my assistant manage the VA for me. Right. Mm. And then when it came to taking the calls, when they come in, I thought, well, I can get a VA to answer my calls live. So I got a VA to answer my calls live. There's, there's services like you could use to get your, your calls answered live. So mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, 
we need a database to manage all the leads. So I use Podio. It's real simple. Um, right. And all the leads come into Podio and my assistant manages that. And then I thought, well, who's going to talk to the sellers? Like if it's a motivated seller, who's going to talk to them and go to the, see the house and make the offer. And then I struggled with that. And I thought, well, what if I found somebody that's already doing it that would just partner with me on the deals? So then I started partnering with local wholesalers that were already doing deals. I called them up and I said, Hey, listen, and these were guys I knew. I said, what if right. I did the marketing and I pre-screened the leads and I gave you pre-screened leads and all you had to do was call the seller up, make an offer, maybe go see the house or not, get it under contract, flip it to one of your buyers. And we split the profits 50, 50. And they loved that idea. And right. so, uh, we started doing that. I started, and I was doing this at the time when we were traveling around Europe in about four different markets. And uh, so I would do the marketing. I would pre-screen the leads, which these local wholesalers, they hate that part of the business, right? They don't, they, they hate sending out tons of marketing and then filtering through a hundred leads, right? If I can give to them like, Hey, listen, I'll do the marketing. I'll do the direct mail. I'll do the cold calling. I'll take care of all of that hard work. And I'll only give you on a silver platter, pre-screen motivated seller leads they're like that's awesome they just right. want to be in their truck all day looking at houses making offers that's all they want to do right so since we manage all of our leads inside of our podio it stays inside of our ecosystem and all of the contracts on the a to b and the b to c side you know are tracked inside of our podio and then my assistant kind of manages it that's why we started doing deals so you may be wondering, like, well, you were splitting the profits 50-50. Well, here's the thing. Because I was splitting it with an expert negotiator who was already good at doing deals, he was right. able to get it at a lower price than I could. And because right. he already had good buyers, he could sell it for higher than I could. So we're splitting the pie, but it's a much bigger pie. Right. And because he's doing this for me, I could do more deals. So I had more pies to <laughs> split. I had bigger, right. more spies. And so it worked out to be great. I was making more money right. partnering with local wholesalers than I was <laughs> trying to do it all on my own. I, lo I love, I love thicker meringue. I like a yes. lot of meringue, you know, on my pie for sure. So that's awesome. That's awesome. So um, we're starting to wind down here, Joe, but I got a couple more questions because I want to dig inside your head just a little bit more um, for the benefit of our viewers and listeners. So I know you got a ton of wonderful uh, personal habits that lend themselves to your success. I know you got a strong spiritual base. Uh, you and I haven't talked that much about it, but we know it's there. Um, so of the personal habits that really lend themselves to you being successful, how about share one or two of those habits with our viewers and listeners? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Sometimes I feel like I'm not very good at the personal habits stuff. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I'm not as disciplined as I would like. Although I am eating vegetable soup right here. <laughs> this is vegetable soup. There's no bad stuff in here. So that that is, I am eating better. <laughs> I love it. I am eating pretty good right now. Uh, so I like to get up early, you know, 5.30, 6 a.m. Try to get up at 5. Sometimes that's a challenge. And when do you I, go to bed normally? When you go to bed? 10, 10 o'clock. Okay. So you're getting a good seven hours. Yeah, that's my goal. Try to get seven hours. Um, I like to read the Bible every morning and I don't do it all the time, but I try to do that and just kind of um, meditate and pray. That's important. I think that's the most important habit of my day, getting mm -hmm. up early, spending some time in the word and um, just making what you, sure. What you've been, what you been reading lately? What you've been reading lately in the Bible? In the Bible? What? Hebrews. Hebrews. I love the book of Hebrews. It's one of my most favorite books in the Bible. Yeah, it's got the hall of faith, doesn't it? I wish I knew who wrote it too. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know who wrote it. We got some good guesses, but we who, don't know. Well, who's you, who do you think wrote it? Well, you know, the most popular guess, of course, is Paul, the apostle Paul, but there's some good, uh, there's some good arguments for other people. I think Apollos, Apollos, well, I think Apollos is probably the second in line as far as the most popular. Yeah. Uh, why do you think Apollos wrote Hebrews? Because I don't think it was Paul. Because um, yeah. Paul always, whenever he writes, you know, like he always says it's him, right? And he always right. talks about say hi to this person and that person. And he talks, right. about, a different he talks style. about himself a lot. 
And this writer never talked about themselves ever. Right. So, um, I, you know, it, it might've been Luke too. It might've been, well, I don't think it was Peter because if you read Peter, <laughs> uh, Peter is first and second Peter is hard to read. Yeah. And the guy who wrote Hebrews, it's a lot easier to read. It's like a totally different writing style. I'm not yeah. an expert in any of this, but so that's why I, I kind of think it's Apollos. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I, I've been reading Hebrews lately and on my back, uh, bookshelf, there is a commentary on Hebrews. And yeah. I was just thinking about it today. I was like, man, I haven't, I used to read, uh, more commentaries and stuff. And so I was thinking about picking that up again and reading it. But, uh, yeah, if anybody listening to this, um, give it a shot. Pick up the book of Hebrews or pick up the gospel of John and just start reading through it. Like read it with an open mind and uh, you'll be amazed at how much awesome stuff is in there. I mean, people think that the Bible is hard to understand um, or it's this cryptic book that was written for centuries ago for other for somebody else at another time. And it just doesn't apply to us today. Man, that's not the case. I mean, I love reading it. I, you know, and I've read through the whole Bible many times, and every time I read it again, I'm like, "Oh, that's awesome!" Like, oh yeah, it's like, how did I miss that the first time? You know, this yeah, this past Sunday morning uh, for the adult Bible study, we're going through the minor prophets, and so I was up this past Sunday morning. So um, I taught the Bible study on the book of Amos. I had never studied the book of Amos like I studied for this class. <laughs> And so, wow, I'm, I won't hold us up on everything I learned about that. Now, speaking of books and everybody hang in there, don't don't dial out on us yet, because in just a moment, Joe's going to tell us how you can get the free book that he's got there um, on uh, wholesale and lease options. So speaking of books, other than the Bible, other than the Bible, give us one of your top favorite books that has had a major impact on your personal life, either relationships, business, whatever. I think my one of my favorite business books is called The Pumpkin Plan. The Pumpkin Plan. The Pumpkin Plan. You got to tell me about The Pumpkin Plan. I don't know anything about The Pumpkin Plan. Um, I'm looking to see it. I have it on Kindle. Right. It on my bookshelf. Um, pumpkin, you've heard of The One Thing, right? Sure. I'm but looking at it right now. It's similar to that where um, the guy uses the analogy of pumpkin farmers. Like these pumpkin farmers will go and they'll spend thousands of dollars for just one pumpkin seed. And they'll go and they'll plant these prize winning giant pumpkin uh, seeds. It's, it's a big deal. Like there's state and local competitions and national competitions for the world's largest vegetables, you know, and these right. people take it seriously. So the largest pumpkin, there's a story he tells in there of this family who started when their baby was just born. Right. So they carve out the pumpkin they put the pic, they put the baby in the pumpkin and they, they a picture of the baby with his head sticking out of the pumpkin. Right. Well, they did that every year till he was in his thirties. That's how <laughs> big these pumpkins are where this kid, the guy was in the pumpkin with his head sticking out. Right. So what they do when they raise, when they're raising these pumpkins is they um, will buy these real expensive seeds from some guy in new England and uh, they'll plant them and they'll, they'll nurture the plant, you know, and as they see the pumpkin grow, it'll have many different branches that come out. Right. Right. And when they see one branch that has one good looking pumpkin on there, they cut off all the other branches except that one branch. So all the nutrients from the soil and all the fertilizer and all that good stuff they put in it all get redirected to that one pumpkin. Right. And that pumpkin becomes a giant pumpkin. So the guy relates that to business where he says, if you want to have a successful business, you just need one pumpkin. So many right. of us are chasing five different things. We have five different businesses that we're going on. But if you want to be successful, focus on your one giant pumpkin and forget everything else. And it's really a challenging book because we all have ideas. Like the definition of an entrepreneur is someone that finds something that works and then does it for a little bit and stops doing it and does something else. <laughs> Shiny object syndrome. Shiny ob we're all guilty of that, especially entrepreneurs. Well, the successful entrepreneurs are the ones that, find their giant pumpkin and focus everything on that. And they won't be distracted by um, other things. They just focus on, and he also talks in there about the sweet spot, which is the combination of um, the thing that you, oh, I can't remember this, but you just got to get the book because um, it, it really helps you focus in and narrow 
in on what you want to do. So like if you're doing real estate deals, you shouldn't, my opinion is you shouldn't try to be doing all the different kinds of strategies, right? You should just focus on rehabbing if that's what you want to do or landlording or wholesaling or lease options. Like just focus, pick one strategy and focus like a hawk on it. You know, like the, the sun is, is billions of joules of energy, right? Yeah. But like, if you go out and stand in the sun, you don't get burnt. But if you put a magnifying glass in that sun, all of those little rays come in and can burn mm. a hole through, you know, a rock. Um, I love it. That's I the love power it. of focus, right? I got to get the pumpkin plant. All right, Joe. So we've kept everybody waiting long enough. So how in the world can they get your book, uh, Wholesaling yes. Lease Options? Wholesalingleaseoptions.com. Um, so that's, I'm sorry. My book is called Wholesaling Lease Options. The, to get the book for free, just pay for shipping is wlobook.com. Wlobook.com. And uh, you get the book. It's basically how to do a deal from beginning to end. I talk about how to get, I talked, I, I talked in this podcast, how to find the free leads from Craigslist and Zillow and other wholesalers. I dive deeper into how to do that. And then I talk about how to talk to sellers and how to negotiate lease option deals. It's super easy. And one of the reasons why I love lease option deals is I don't negotiate with sellers, right? I just say, well, what do you want for your house? Okay, I can get that for you. That's my negotiating, right? I don't have to beat them down on price and negotiate repairs and all of that stuff. Um, and then I talk about how to sell them lightning fast. Like you don't need a right. huge buyer's list. Uh, you can, if you got a good property, like I teach, they they sell really, really fast. And um, it's one of the easiest and fastest ways that I found to do, to make money in real estate today, wholesaling lease options. And again, they can get it at wlobook.com. Um, yeah. And I also have a podcast, Jay. Can I give them the website for that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the uh, Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. Or you can go to realestateinvestingmastery.com to find my show. I've been doing it for seven or eight years now. I have almost 700 episodes, which is <laughs> which blows my mind. But uh, I've been doing that podcast for a long time and I love it. I interview awesome people. Got to get you on the show, Jay. Awesome. And, um, I'd, love to, I'd love to be over there. Yeah. So check out the podcast as well. That's awesome. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to share your uh, strategies uh, and you know the, the things that have made you successful, what you focus on. I love the book you shared. And I tell you, man, um, as I said uh, in the introduction, when we started out, you've got a servant's heart. You're all about go giving. And I just appreciate it. So again, thank you so much for being here on the show, Joe. Thank you, Jay. It's good all talking right. to you, man. So folks, until uh, the next show, uh, I'm Jay Connor of the Private Money Authority, uh, wishing you the next level uh, in your real estate investing world. We'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.